Now, this is going to be a very concise introduction to and survey of parts of the Gospel of John, the fourth gospel. I am going to make it concise, even though I would be tempted to make it longer. I have a two-volume commentary that's 1,600 pages on John, and I have a more recent, smaller background commentary on the Gospel of John. All of that to say, we could go on for a long time. But most scholars believe that the Gospel of John was addressed especially to Jewish believers in Jesus. And of course, uh, also some Gentiles who recognized that they were converting to a Jewish faith, faith in the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish God, the Jewish scriptures. And so uh, it, it's, it's very Jewish in its content. Some older writers as early as the late second century said it was addressed especially to refuting Gnostics, but full-blown Gnostics don't appear until the second century, at which point it became very important to refute them, for which the Gospel of John was pressed into purpose. But that doesn't mean that was its original purpose. The Dead Sea Scrolls showed scholars the, the Jewishness of the light darkness motif and other contrasts and helped them to recognize that it probably goes back to first century debates within synagogues and John was addressing those debates. Jewish believers in Jesus had been kicked out of some synagogues. Now, this is probably not true of all synagogues in the late first century. Um, it's probably at least true for Smyrna and Philadelphia, where we actually read about some conflicts in Revelation chapters two and three. The Gospel of John is arranged around festivals in Jerusalem. So you've got Passover in chapters 2, 6, and 11 and following. You have an unnamed festival in chapter 5, but it doesn't really matter that it's named because the big issue in chapter 5 is the Sabbath. And then you have, in chapter 7, the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, the author of John's Gospel really knows the topography of Judea and Galilee quite well. One gathers from that that this was somebody who grew up in Judea and Galilee, or at least lived there a long time, which I believe he, he was uh, from, from there. But Cana and Bethsaida were near Capernaum, and Capernaum and Bethsaida were lakeside towns involved in the fishing industry. Tiberias is also mentioned. It was a major center on the Lake of Galilee. Bethany was about two miles from Jerusalem. Samaria's Sychar, a probably modern Ascar, and Jacob's Well, still known to this day, were there. John also knows some sites that aren't securely known to us today, like Bethany beyond the Jordan and Enon near Salim. He seems to have a pretty good handle on the geography of the land. Most people outside of Judea and Galilee had never heard of many of these places. And in fact, outside of Galilee, even in Jerusalem, probably many people hadn't heard of, of Cana. But he particularly knows Jerusalem very well. Though he may be writing a quarter of a century after Jerusalem's destruction in the year 70, archeology span confirms his reports to be very accurate where we can test him. You've got the Pool of Bethesda, with its five porches. People didn't understand why it had five porches. Was it like shaped funny? It had five sides. But archeologists have found it under St. Anne's Monastery where uh, tradition located it. And indeed the pool had four sides and then one portico running down the middle or one porch running down the middle. The Pool of Siloam, Recent discoveries have uncovered just how massive it really was. The Pool of Bethesda is, is shown here. Uh, some of the excavations, I would show the video, which John you can see fine. right here, but that would take us too much time. Same with the Pool of Siloam. I could show you the video. In John chapter but nine, it would take us too much time. So moving on to the author. The author is an eyewitness 
uh, or at least for many people think the, the source of John's gospel or the source of the later part of John's gospel goes back to this eyewitness source, the one who claims to be there. Uh, John 13, 23, uh, one disciple whom Jesus loved. And it says that he was leaning back on his chest. Uh, back then, the, the way people often did banquets, they would recline on couches or rugs if they didn't have couches. And they could often recline three or four people per, per couch or rug. And the way they would they would recline, you could have somebody to the left of the person, their feet would be pointing away from the table, they'd be arranged a little bit back from the uh, on the couch. So technically, if they if they leaned over to talk to the person to their left, their their head could almost be touching the person's chest. The same expression for in intimacy, Eistan Kulpan, is used for Jesus in the bosom of the Father in chapter 1, verse 18. In any case, John 13, 23, John 19, 26, 19, 35, th this disciple turns out to be a witness. He's also kind of a friendly rival with Peter. And that, that makes sense why he would later you know, publish his own gospel um, to give kind of a different twist on on what we may have from the, the stories from Peter. In chapter 21, some people consider that an epilogue. Um, I am not totally in agreement with that. But anyway, in chapter 21, we, we again have Peter and the beloved disciple. And we also have a statement affirming that what this disciple testified, people know to be true because they trust this, this disciple. So the author was an eyewitness. There are debates about who, who the eyewitness is. I have a colleague who says it must have been Lazarus. Um, another great scholar says it was Thomas. Most scholars say we don't know. But a number of scholars say it was somebody named John. Many of those scholars say that it was probably a different John than John the Apostle. But he was an eyewitness. I think he probably was John the Apostle. But again, there's there's debates on that. But yeah, if you want my opinion, I vote for John, the apostle. Well, what about the focus of the gospel? The focus of the gospel is the word made flesh. That's what we have in the prologue in the um, first 18 verses of John's gospel. And these come to a climax. God created all things through the word, verse 3. But it comes to this climax in verses 14 through 18 where the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Wait a minute. Grace and truth were already present in the law. But we'll, we'll get into that. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only God who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. Well, John isn't just pulling this out of thin air. He's evoking language based on the first giving of God's word on Mount Sinai. At that time, God gave, gave his word on tablets of stone. Um, this time, in John 1, 14 through 18, the word becomes flesh. But in Exodus 32, Israel sinned with the golden calf. Moses smashed the tablets, so he needed to get some more. He went back up on the mountain. And God said, Moses, I'm not going to dwell with these people. Moses begged God, please show me your glory. God says, nobody can see all my glory and live. But I'll show you part of my glory. I'll make my goodness pass before your, your eyes. Um, and that's uh, 3318. And as the Lord passes before Moses, shows him part of his glory, there's a cosmic spectacle of fireworks. But more than that, God revealed his goodness. God revealed his character and nature to Moses. God declared, I'm gracious and merciful. Oh, I punish the wicked to the third and fourth generation. But my faithful love, my chesed, is to the thousandth generation of those who fear me and keep my commandments. So much greater is God's mercy than his wrath. He says, I'm abounding in chesed ve'emet, 
abounding in faithful love and covenant faithfulness. Or it could be translated full of grace and truth. Well, after God reveals his character to Moses, Moses says, all right, God, if that's the way you are, then forgive us and dwell with us. And God said, I will. Well, some 1,300 years later, or 1,500 years later, it depends on when you date the Exodus. Anyway, this is the background for John 1, 14 through 18. The first time, the word was the law on tablets of stone. This time, the word comes embodied. The word comes in flesh. The first time, God dwells with Israel. Second time, God dwells with humanity. First time, Moses beholds his glory. Second time, the disciples, we beheld his glory. First time, the glory is full of grace and truth. The second time, again, the glory is full of grace and truth. Both times, it says, no one can see God fully. Well, how do we know it's the right background? If we just had one or two points of contact, we might just be guessing, which people do a lot. But here we have many points of contact, all alluding to the only, only Old Testament text that has all of them. Further, the climax of John's prologue addresses the law, contrasting Jesus with the law. Grace and truth were present in the law, but fuller grace and truth came by Jesus, because in him, we can finally see fully God's heart to us. What does it mean that the disciples saw God's glory in Jesus? You know, kind of, you know, you've got a transfiguration in Mark 9, Matthew 17, Luke 9. But in John, it's like the whole gospel, the, his, his whole ministry reveals his glory. So his first sign in Cana of Galilee, chapter 2 and verse 11, reveals his glory. But especially this glory climaxes in the cross, chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. Thus we see God's heart of grace and truth most fully when we look at the cross. So, yeah, grace and truth were there in the law. But remember, Moses couldn't see all of God's glory. He could only see part of God's glory because no one could see God and live. But in Jesus, and especially in the revelation of the cross, it says, no one has beheld God at any time, but the one and only God in the bosom of the Father has made him known. And the word there in Greek, exegesita, means to declare, expound the the, 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 the nature, the character of, so that Jesus could stand before his disciples and say, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. Well, I don't know how many of you sing, lift Jesus higher. He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw everybody to myself. It is biblical to lift up the Lord in praise, to exalt the Lord in praise. But that's really not what this verse in John's gospel means. That's John 12, 32. If we go on just one more verse, we find out that what he's saying is, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw everybody to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So uh, er earlier in John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And then he says to his enemies in chapter 8, verse 28, when you will have lifted up the Son of Man. It, and it, it evokes Isaiah 52, 13. My servant will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And then goes on to talk about Isaiah 53. So when you sing that song, lift Jesus higher. And you're ev evoking John 12, where he says he'll draw all people to himself. You're singing, crucify him, crucify him. Okay, God knows our hearts. You know, if you're a songwriter, please look your verses up in context before you write a song that millions of people may sing. Well, now to look at another motif in John's gospel. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the feast, this is the Feast of Tabernacles, John 7, verse 2. Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone's thirsty, let them come to me. 
Let them drink whoever believes in me. As the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from his belly. Whose belly is he talking about? Well, it depends kind of on how you punctuate this. So different translations punctuate it differently. Um, the Latin church fathers went one way. The Greek church fathers went the other way. I happen to agree with the Greek church fathers on this one, but let's not get into a debate over this detail. So it goes on to say, by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And this happened after Jesus was glorified, after he was lifted up, crowned king of the Jews, enthroned upon a cross. But this reflects a motif that runs throughout John's gospel. John 1, 26 and 33, John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus' baptism is greater than John's baptism. In John chapter 2, when Jesus turns water to wine, where you've got six water pots set aside for ritual purification. And that's what it says in, in the verse. And of course, they used stone water pots because stone was believed not to contract ritual impurity. So you didn't have to break it if it became ritually impure. Think of that next time you use plastic. Anyway, by using the water pots or something else, Jesus defiles them, at least temporarily, for their ritual function. Um, or at least we could say he finds a, a greater purpose for them, something more important, like joy at his friend's wedding. John chapter 3 and verse 5, we have possibly an allusion to another use of ritual water, uh, but taken to a different level, because remember, uh, the water flowing from his belly talks about the spirit. So born of water and of the spirit. Well, in Greek, the construction could mean born of the water of the spirit. It's a hendiades with an exegetical chi for anybody who's interested. Um, this was Calvin's interpretation, a number of scholars' interpretation, not everybody's interpretation. Actually, there's nothing I can possibly say about the New Testament that is everybody's interpretation. But again, we don't have to debate every detail. So when a Gentile would convert to Judaism, they would be immersed in water. Now, there's some debate about when that started, but there are enough references to it from early enough, including from at least one Gentile and maybe two Gentile sources fairly early, that suggest that this was already understood, even way outside of Judea and Galilee. So when, when Gentiles would convert to Judaism, one thing they'd have to do was wash away their former impurities. And when a Gentile converted to Judaism, they also were counted as if they were a newborn child, a new creation. Jesus may here speak not of physical water, a physical immersion, but he may be speaking of a spiritual immersion, a spiritual proselyte baptism, a baptism in the spirit. Uh, in any case, he is um, talking about the importance of the spirit in becoming a new creation. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, we read about living water that's greater than the water of uh, Jacob's sacred well, sacred to the Samaritans. Uh, and it's also what Jesus provides is, is greater than the worship in Jerusalem or the Samaritans' Mount Gerizim, the passage goes on to speak about. Uh, and here's, here are just pictures of Mount Gerizim and, and she, uh, Shechem uh, and Mount Ebal. So, when Jesus reveals himself to the Samaritan woman, she, uh, when, when he offers her this living water and then he tells her about her past and she's like, whoa, you're a prophet. We may not catch how that goes on to the next point. Wow, you're a prophet. So, hey, you Jews say we should worship in Jerusalem, but we worshiped past tense in this mountain, past tense because the Jewish king had destroyed the Samaritan 
temple on Mount Gerizim uh, about a century before this. But we, we don't always grasp the connection between the prophet and changing the subject, apparently. Well, she's not completely changing the subject because Samaritans, according to the traditions that we have available, didn't believe there were any prophets after Moses until the final one. Josephus tells us they followed a prophet, but they probably thought he was the final one. Anyway, so they were expecting the Tachab, the restorer. But, you know, if this guy is a prophet, you Jews are right. We Samaritans are wrong. So I'm in trouble. We're supposed to worship in Jerusalem if you guys are right. But, yay, we can't do that. We're not welcome in your temple. And you weren't really welcome in Mount Gerizim either. But anyway, they uh, it could have been a very interesting turn in the conversation. Jesus says, well, salvation is from the Jewish people, but guess what? Um, the time is coming when true worship will not be in Jerusalem or on this mountain, but the true sphere of worship will be in the spirit and in truth. Maybe another Hindite is in the spirit of truth but certainly by God's spirit. So greater than the water of Jacob's well. And in chapter five, Jesus does what the pool of Bethesda couldn't. There were a lot of people who resorted to healing shrines with pools. And there's some evidence suggesting that some people use the pool of Bethesda that way, including some later um, pagans who, when they lived in Jerusalem, treated that as a, as a healing shrine based on tradition going back to healings or at least one healing that took place there earlier. Jesus heals a man at the pool. The pool didn't heal the man. Jesus is greater than the waters of popular superstition and religion. If this man ends up essentially betraying Jesus, here is the pool of Bethesda on a model of Jerusalem. Again, you see the the four sides and the uh, portico running down the middle. And you can see the temple in the background. They weren't that far apart geographically. There's a closer view of it with actually real water in it, I think. It looks like real water. Uh, certainly reflects like real water, but it may be rainwater. Anyway, contrast this guy with the guy at another pool, the pool of Siloam in John 9. Now, the guy in John 5, he was infirm for 38 years. The guy in John 9 was infirm from birth, both infirm for a long time. Jesus says, the one sin no more. He says of the other, neither has this man sinned nor his parents. The one apparently betrays Jesus to please the authorities. The other man won't betray Jesus, and he ends up being expelled from the synagogue as a result, which would be relevant to John's audience if they were having problems with the synagogue authorities. Some of these synagogue authorities may have even been saying to them, you guys don't know the Bible. You don't know God's word. If you knew God's word, you wouldn't follow this Jesus. And John is encouraging the believers, actually, you do know the word. You know the word made flesh. And you have something that the these synagogue leaders don't actually claim to have for themselves. They, Many of them believe that the spirit especially in prophetic form, had been quenched when Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi died. But Jesus empowered his followers with the Holy Spirit. And so this was something, well, let me not digress too much. That's what my dissertation was on. So here we see the Pool of Jerusalem, sorry, the Pool of Siloam on the Jerusalem model. Again, not too far from the temple, south of the of the temple. Uh, so as you're walking walking north, you'll, you'll get there. Jesus, in this case, works through the Pool of Siloam. Siloam's water was used in a special ritual for the Festival of Tabernacles. Jesus healed this man on the final day of that festival. The pool by itself could do nothing, but Jesus sent the man and so healed him. Much of John's audience may have been kicked out of their synagogue so they could really appreciate this. John 13, 5, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. This passage, it goes back and forth between Jesus serving his disciples, washing their feet, and announcing that he was about to be betrayed. So the foot washing symbolizes 
what the cross accomplished, serving to the point of death. He acts as a suffering servant here. And he calls us to love and serve one another the same way. So coming back to John chapter 7, this is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and I like to give background because, well, you may not get this on your own. So, uh, I mean, scholars often know this. You can find it in commentaries. But for those of you who don't have access to that or who are just wanting a crash course very concisely, I want to give you some of the background. So this is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles lasted eight days in this period. For seven days, priests brought water from the Pool of Siloam into the temple. This public ritual symbolized their hope in future waters flowing from the temple, which they considered to be the foundation uh, or the foundation stone of the temple, the belly or the navel of the earth. And on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would read from Ezekiel 47 and Zechariah 14. And when I say the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, remember that's when Jesus says this. Both of these passages speak of living water gushing from Jerusalem or the temple in the last days. And so when Jesus says this, as the scripture has said, in this case, he's probably evoking the scripture that had just been read on that day. Jesus speaks of the scripture where waters go forth from the belly, well, probably from the, the belly of the earth in, in Jewish thinking, the, the, the temple itself, Ezekiel 47. Jesus thereby claims to be the foundation stone of God's new temple and the source of these rivers of living water. This motif comes to a climax in John 1934, where John is emphatic the beloved disciple saw this with his own eyes. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Now, scholars have pointed out that when the pericardial sac around the heart is pierced, something like blood and water, well, blood and something like water can flow out from that. But only John among the four gospels chooses to emphasize this point. Why does he want to emphasize it? It provides a fitting climax for this water motif. Now, coming back to John chapter 4, which I dealt with just kind of in passing already. Most women came to the well together, but one woman wasn't welcome to come with the other women. Uh, and we, we gather that, I mean, my wife is from Congo in Central Africa. She tells me, yep, women go to the well together. Of course, this wasn't Congo and Central Africa, but we also have lots of sources in ancient literature, even going back to Genesis, that show us that, yeah, women usually came to the well together. Why didn't she come with the other women? Well, since she was coming at the hottest hour of the day, she probably was coming at that time because she didn't want to run into the other women. So anybody who met her there would probably understand that she was an outcast. Um, for some reason, the other women didn't like her. She didn't get along too well with them. Jesus asks her for a drink. No religious Jew would do that. Religious Jews, the basic idea was that Jewish women were ritually impure one week out of every month. But with Samaritan women, Religious Jewish men thought that Samaritan women were ritually impure every week out of every month from the time that they were little babies. And that was whether they were immoral or not. Further, wells were notorious. Now, I know there are detractors to this, but if you need the footnotes, they're in my commentary. So, um, yeah, I can't, I can't stop to debate every issue, but... Wells were notorious. Where did Jacob meet Rachel? Well, at, uh, that was Genesis, that was Genesis 29, that's right. 
Where did Isaac's steward meet Rebecca? Well, at a well in Genesis 24. Where did Moses meet Zipporah? At a well in Exodus chapter 2. And we do have some other sources from antiquity that show us that wells were good places to find mates. So, hey, forget the singles bar uh, or you know, wherever else. But wells don't always perform this function today, but you may as well. So what is this woman supposed to think? I mean, obviously the guy's coming on to her. He then asks her what sounds like a leading question. Go get your husband. In other words, are you married? She responds, I'm not married. Like the worthless guy who won't marry me, he doesn't count. Fortunately, however, Jesus is able to clarify his point. He tells her about her past relationships and she realizes that he's not a flirt, he's a prophet. And again, sometimes people think because I'm, in, well, because I imply that the woman has not been behaving completely well according to ancient moral standards. Some people have taken that to say, oh, I'm picking on her because she's a woman. No, Jesus hung out with tax collectors and sinners. Most of the people he hung out with were considered sinful by um, very religious people. So please don't think I'm picking on them. But it brings us to the next issue. Again, Samaritans didn't believe in prophets. If he's a prophet, the Jews are right. They say I have to worship in Jerusalem. So she asks about the right site for worship. Jesus says, you know, let's transcend this whole debate. Not that it's not worth talking about theologically, but it's not the issue. The true place of worship is in spirit and in truth. And she becomes the first person to whom Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah. Jesus crossed three barriers in this passage, the ethnic or cultural barrier Jews don't deal with Samaritans, verse 9. The implied moral barrier, I mean, okay, she could have been married to five older guys, they all died, whatever. But again, people in antiquity would look at that a certain way. So gender, chapter 4, verse 27. The disciples were amazed that he was speaking with a woman. You say, what's up with that? Well, again, this was the culture back then. As again, we can document from the book of Sirach and all sorts of other places, and um, especially conservative places in various parts of the ancient Mediterranean world. So Jesus summons us to cross barriers in sharing his love, like he did. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever heard this verse, John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, who's the thief? Well, I like to bring this up because people, it's a good illustration of the importance of context. John chapter nine, Jesus defends, uh, or heals a man of blindness, and then he needs to defend a man against the accusations of the Pharisees. This formerly blind man is expelled from the synagogue, and you've also got the Pharisees who expel him. Well, in John 10, there's no break in the original between chapters. So as Jesus goes on to speak of being the good shepherd, risking his life for the sheep, confronting wolves and robbers, this is Jesus defending this man who's one of his sheep, who's been kicked out of the synagogue and told basically, ah, you're not Jewish enough. You, you, don't, you don't agree with the synagogue leaders. Uh, I, this, this is, again, these particular synagogue leaders. This is not a statement about all synagogue leaders. But anyway... Uh, this man is an example of one of Jesus' sheep. He belongs to God's people. And the people who kicked him out, Jesus treats them like thieves and robbers and wolves. And you can go back to the Old Testament and see how the prophets often spoke of God as, as a good shepherd for his people and defending his people against the false shepherds who were exploiting his people. So this guy is part of part of God's people, even if expelled from the synagogue. Well, what does that have to do with the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy? In the context, in John chapter 10, he mentions the thief several times. And these are the people who are leading people away from Jesus. Jesus lays down his life to protect the sheep from their enemies. 
Shepherds kept sheep in the fold at night to protect them from predators like thieves, robbers, wolves, and lions aren't really mentioned in the passage. But Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. They recognize me. So he can give this man as an example of the sheep. Or in chapter 20, verse 16, when he says, Mary. And she says, Robomai, master. She recognizes the voice of the shepherd. Jesus even compares our relationship with him in verses 14 and 15 to his relationship with the Father. Throughout this gospel, Jesus models a relationship with the Father. And he says, my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. That's the most beautiful, wonderful thing. When I was a, a young believer in Jesus, just maybe two, three years after my conversion from atheism, when God first began to open my ears to hear his voice, and I had feelings and impressions before, but to really be, be able to sense more articulately and deeply what his spirit was saying to me. And that's been a beautiful part of my experience with God since then. Well, this relates to a theme that we see later in this gospel about God's presence. This was something not just his sheep within the gospel, like this formerly blind man or Mary experienced, but this was meant to be something that all his followers would experience. And of course, 1 John chapter 2 emphasizes this point, how we, we've all received an anointing from the Holy One, not just the original disciples, but John says this to all of them. So God's presence is not something we have to work up. We don't have to wait for a feeling. John 14 through 16 speaks of the spirit living in us who follow Jesus. John chapter 14, verses two and three, and my father's house are many dwelling places. We have a King James that said mansions, but mansions meant something different when the King James was translated I, I had a student years ago who said, oh no, I need those mansions my, when I preach at funerals. But no, don't worry. I'm sure they're very nice, but these dwelling places, it's actually something better than something you just have to wait till you die to experience. So I'm gonna say something about that now. Again, this is a matter of debate. Everything's a matter of debate in New Testament studies, but I'm going to try to bring out what I think the context says and use this as another illustration of the importance of context. My father's house are many dwelling places. Well, I'm going to go there. I'm going to come back and take you to be with me so you can be with me where I am. Well, what coming again is he talking about? Obviously, Jesus talks in the Bible about he's going to come back in the future. And he talks about that in the Gospel of John. Also, he talks about the raising of the dead at the last day and so forth. Some people think some of those things were added later, but there's no textual evidence for that. It's just because they want John to only talk about one thing. And I don't think John has to talk about just one thing. Anyway, so John 14, which coming again is he talking about in the context? Well, in verse 18, he, uh, starting with 17, he talks about the spirit of truth dwells with you and you know, through Jesus and will be in you. I won't leave you as orphans, verse 18. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me. That doesn't sound like the second coming. But you will see me because I live, you also will live. So the receiving of resurrection life in the context of the giving of the Spirit, that day you'll realize I'm in my Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. And then verse 23 makes it even clearer. If anyone loves me, my Father will love them, will come to them and make our home with that person. And again, in chapter 16, he talks about the coming of the Spirit. He doesn't talk about the second coming in this context in John's Gospel. But what does he mean by the Father's house? Well, in chapter two, it means the temple. In chapter eight, it means the father's household, same, same Greek word. So that doesn't resolve it. 
uh, people often say the Father's house is heaven because we have a certain preconception of where the mansions are. But what does he mean by the dwelling place? This term is used only twice in the entire New Testament. It's the Greek term mone. And the other place just happens to be in the same context. So it may shed some light in this. Again, whoever loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. And we will come to them and make our dwelling place, our monet, within each of them. Again, not to say we won't have this more fully. Revelation 21 talks about that. But right now we're talking about this context in John's gospel. The related verb, meno, is frequent in this context. Remain or dwell or abide in me and I will remain in you. The branch must remain in the vine. The spirit of truth lives meno with you and will be in you. So let's look at the flow of context to see what this is really talking about. In my father's house are many rooms. One translation says many dwelling places. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back, take you to be with me, that you also may be with me where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And, and Thomas, thank God for Thomas here. Thomas asks the obvious question. Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So where's Jesus going? He's going to the Father. He's going to come back and bring them to the Father. Is this talking about the second coming? When do we come to the Father through Jesus? When do we enter the Father's presence through Jesus? Well, he's the way, the truth, and the life. When we come through Jesus to the Father, that's when we become believers in Jesus. And he speaks of our friendship with him. John 15, I've called you friends because all things I've heard from my Father I've made known to you. We may say, well, that was good enough for the early disciples. That's not about us now. But look at John 16, 13. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, whatever he hears, he will speak. And it goes on to say, he'll show you my things. He'll show you the things of me. So just as Jesus heard from the Father, so the Spirit hears from Jesus and passes that on to us. What it's saying is we can have a personal relationship with God now. Not just the, the first disciples, but Jesus is with us now. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And one verse that tells me that is John 3.16. I don't know if that's familiar to anyone, but we could expound John 3.16 by asking, who is the world? In the very next chapter in John 4, Jesus is the savior of the world, and that includes Samaritans. So we could develop this um, aspect of the verse in light of the book's themes, talking about missions, talking about ethnic reconciliation. These are all important matters. Or we could focus on the issue of God's love, tracing this theme through the book, preaching on this theme. Or we could preach several points from this text. We could talk about God's love, the world, and God giving Jesus at the cross and develop each of these in the context of the whole book. But I'm gonna focus on one aspect of this. Whoever believes in him, what kind of faith is genuinely saving faith? Because that's what he's talking about here. Well, just before he was talking with Nicodemus, it says that many people saw the signs that he did and they believed in his name. But Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to them. Literally, he wouldn't, wouldn't believe in them because he knew what they were made of. So not all faith is the kind of faith that he's looking for. The kind of faith he's looking for is, well, the word faith and the word believe, in, in English, you, you can't necessarily tell how related they are, but in Greek, pistuo and pistis are closely related. And they also have to do with God's faithfulness. We can have faith in the one who's faithful. 
we can trust the one who's trustworthy. We can rely on the one who's reliable. Faith has to do with trust, and it, it's supposed to be active when it's real faith, the kind of kind of faith that goes beyond that faith in John chapter 2. John chapter 20 gives us the chief example of this in John's gospel. When Jesus says to Thomas, again, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Trust me. This is not a, a trust without some evidence. I mean, Jesus is standing right in front of him. But Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, because you've seen me, you have believed. So how is faith defined in this context? It's defined where John makes this climactic confession. People have been confessing things about Jesus all the way through the gospel. John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or Nathaniel, Rabbi, you're the Son of God, you're the King of Israel. Or Peter in John chapter 6, you're the Holy One of God. But now we come to the climactic confession of John's gospel that reminds us of the introduction to John's gospel. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 1.18, framing that prologue, the one and only God who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. Well, here at the conclusion of the main body of John's gospel, I do think that John 21 belongs in the gospel, but um, sometimes you have a climax and then an anticlimax. So this is the climax of the main body of the gospel. John said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, you believed. The kind of faith the gospel of John is looking for is the kind of faith that recognizes that Jesus is not just anybody. In fact, he's not just a prophet. He's not even just the Messiah, but he's our Lord and he's God. Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. We look through him to see the heart of the Father. And then Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Well, those who have not seen in the flesh, that's, that's us. And all the believers after Jesus ascended to heaven. Um, ascension is suggested, I believe, in John 20, verse 17. That's, again, another debate. So John then gives the statement of purpose for his gospel. Jesus did lots of signs, but these are written so that you may believe. For us, we also don't believe without evidence. We have the evidence of testimony, the testimony of the beloved disciple in this gospel. And then we have other testimonies elsewhere that are reported for us of Paul and Peter and others. But these are written so you may believe. What kind of faith is you looking for? Faith in Jesus as our Lord and our God. And that's what John means when he says, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's what he said in 316, whoever believes has eternal life. So it's not like, okay, well, you know, I prayed a prayer once, and now I'm a, I belong to another religion that doesn't believe in Jesus, or that is against Jesus, or whatever, you know, now I'm an atheist, or whatever. That's not the kind of faith he's talking about as saving faith. Neither is it enough to just believe Jesus was a nice person. I mean, it's good to believe that, but it's not enough. This is the climactic confession of John's gospel. Of course, Jesus confessed his own identity in different ways, often with Old Testament imagery. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. And finally, in John 8.58, for in Abraham, Ganesthi, Ego, and me, before Abraham was, I am. And he says this at the Feast of Tabernacles, where the priests were known to utter these words from the book of Isaiah. Anihu, I am he, 
speaking of of God, claiming to uh, to be God. So uh, Jesus says, "I am the gate. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine, and so forth." Now, another issue in terms of faith. As Jesus spoke in chapter 8, it says many entrusted themselves to him, many believed in him. And to those who believed in him, he said, if you continue or dwell or abide in my teaching, then you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. By the end of the chapter, the people that he's addressing pick up stones in order to stone him to death. They don't succeed, but the point is they didn't keep believing. Saving faith must be persevering faith. John chapter 15, remain in me, I'll remain in you. If you don't, you'll be like a branch that's thrown away and withers, and thrown into the fire and burn. Now I know this is also a matter of debate, but for most Christians around the world, it's not a matter of debate. Uh, Catholics agree, Orthodox agree. Among Protestants, both Calvinists and Arminians agree. Calvinists would say, well, if you don't persevere to the end, you weren't really saved to begin with. Arminians would say, maybe you were saved to begin with, but you fell away, you're not saved now. But we all agree. Well, <laughs> all, all, all of us except the people who think that, you know, the person who once prayed a prayer will always be saved no matter what. They may become an atheist. They may become the Antichrist. Well, they probably wouldn't say it for the Antichrist. But anyway, almost all Christians agree on this point. You need to persevere to the end to be saved. And here I could end with one more excerpt from the Gospel of John with a few comments about Lazarus, because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. This is the traditional tomb of Lazarus. You can tell by the smell, we're underground, a lot of rock, but uh, it's it's somewhere in this area. It's in Bethany. This is Bethany, and Bethany is called El Azariah today, the, the town of, of Lazarus, commemorating Jesus' raising of Lazarus. And uh, here is the traditional tomb, and it will not be the easiest thing for me to get in there, but um, I guess I'm going to try. I uh, should have done this when I was four years old. It would have been a lot easier to, uh, it was shorter back then. Anyway, yep, here we go. Yep. And here we can see the remains of what look like ossuaries. And places in the wall, I assume, to slide the ossuaries. Ossuaries were from a particular period, so this is definitely an ancient tomb. Uh, ossuaries were mostly in use in the late Second Temple period and stopped being used around the year 70. So, uh, I mean, a few beyond that, but mostly to the year 70. So, uh, yeah, if this is exactly the tomb, Lazarus would have actually had to come up a few steps, but whether it's the exact tomb or not, somewhere in this area, Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. 